Hi, Joe. Hi, um, team. It's a great day for us today to have you here at, at Leipzig at HHL, Creative School of Management, one of the most traditional business schools in, in Germany throughout. For us, it's a great day to honor you for your lifetime achievements. And uh, let me start by asking you one, to me, fundamental question already Peter Tucker posed. Which is it or what is it you want to be remembered for? Uh, yeah, thank you, Timo. Um, that does get the purpose. Uh, what is it that you want your outcome mm -hmm. to be? Uh, and um, th through my work with um, Peter Drucker, I learned how important it was to deal with him in a manner that represented integrity, not to um, misuse his name, uh, not to uh, misuse him in, in any way, or his family. Um, and it, to me, it represented a very high standard of behavior. And I've been working toward that uh, high standard of um, of behavior, morality behavior. And uh, so I hope to be remembered as a person of integrity. Uh, and that becomes, for me, a purpose. In other words, it motivates. Uh, the reason Peter wanted pe people to ask that question and do it periodically is because it changes over time. I wouldn't have answered this uh, the same way, uh, you know, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, even 10 years ago. Your purpose continues to change as you change. And um, the closer we get to older, uh, um, our senior times in, in uh, a profession or in life, the more serious I think that question becomes. It was, certainly was for Drucker. And, and that's the way he taught it, and that's the way he lived it. And I began to see the power of it. Um, and um, so I'm very committed to it. It's a process. It, uh, I haven't arrived uh, by any means. And so uh, I don't think any of us really arrive. Uh, this is the authentic authenticity that people are talking about. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's what I see. And it does come out of my Oh, my whole life background, uh, uh, including faith, but it also comes out of an, a, the example set by Drucker. I mean, you devoted more than at least 30, more than 30 years of your professional life to deal with Drucker writings, to work with him. And yeah. What was in the first place, what made you go to Claremont to devote, in a sense, your whole yeah. academic thinking right. to, his, to his work in yeah. that direction? The, um, in 1962, when I graduated from college, I was working in a, in the, uh, my first job was uh, to work as a finance, budget and finance analyst. And then my third job was to go back as a senior financial controller of, uh, of the Space and Life Support Department of United Technology, Hamilton Standard Division. Uh, and we were dealing with complex projects uh, uh, back then in the Apollo program. And the only thing we had to manage with were the field manuals put out by the Air Force Systems Command and put out by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. But they were pretty technical field manuals. They didn't deal with some of the problems, managerial problems, problems of culture, problems of organization, problems of spirit that we were uh, clearly dealing with. They were tactical, I would say, in, in a large part. So. I was single at the time, both, both, um, both times at Hamilton Center, and I spent a lot of time in a library trying to find answers. And I searched uh, the Hartford Library, and I searched our local, uh, uh, local library in, in, and, and, uh, in um, Windsor Locks, Connecticut, and I, the only thing I really could find was the practice of management that was helpful, and it was very helpful. I later told Peter this story that in designing and trying to design management systems, helping to design management systems for the department and for the uh, vice president, 
um, I used his work on um, the practice of management. And he said, well, you had no alternative. <laughs> and I said, well, is he making an ego statement? No. What he was stating was the other. There was nothing else available that was uh, fairly systematic. And uh, so it was not a, uh, he was not bragging. He was stating a fact. Uh, the reason he wrote the practice of management is because there were threads available in various uh, writings, but he, and he tried to pull it together. And, uh, and he did indeed for, for our purposes. So that's how I got involved. My undergraduate major was management. And, um, uh, but his work had penetrated at that time in the early 60s, the late 50s. He wrote it in 54 and, 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 and it penetrated first really in Japan and he came back here when we were suffering from Japanese competition, uh, we in the United States. Um, so, um, so uh, that was my first experience and then my wife um, bought me the uh, management tasks book in 1973. She bought it at a, a, book, a book club through a book club and gave it to me and, uh, and I began to devour the thing. And I began, then I began later on to compare the practice of management and the management task in detail. And then of course I taught it uh, uh, for 10 years uh, at, at Claremont and I've taught it uh, since. But okay, I'm skipping a step here. There was, I was um, given the opportunity by my uh, professor and chair of the department, Alfred Tim, at Union College, where I was doing my graduate work, to, to teach and to pursue the PhD at NYU, New York University, uh, as he said, as a gentleman, you know, rather than trying to tough it out in, in New York City. And, uh, and so I thought about it, and, and I, I said, okay, he offered me a half-time appointment and so on. Uh, his advice was to, um, to study with Drucker, and, and Drucker had, was very influential in my master's degree program because he was an Austrian and also a student of Peter Drucker at New York University. So um, that's how I got further connected with, with Drucker. And <laughs> And then while studying economics at, at NYU in 1969, the, uh, um, uh, the age of discontinuity came out. And I thought, given what I was studying economics, it was all wrong. He had it wrong. And then successively, as the years went by, I began to see, no, economics was wrong. He had it right. And um, on the four major uh, uh, thrusts. So all of that began to build my interest in Peter. So. Uh, uh, at Union, uh, Union was a great place. I met my wife and our children were born during that time uh, in Schenectady and uh, I loved the place. Went to school there, graduated from there. And um, uh, as you'll see in the talk today, it still leaves pretty, pretty deep marks. And, um, but what Al did was to put in me further his love for Drucker. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, when, it, when we were having some difficulty in managing the, the master's program, uh, uh, gaining autonomy at the school, um, we ran up against kind of a wall of the trustees. And um, so he said, well, you know, uh, we ha uh, this is probably a good time for us to think about leaving. And he went to the University of Vermont as a dean. And another one of my friends, Don Griesinger, came to uh, um, uh, work for his brother-in-law in, -law in uh, Glendale. And so there were openings then uh, for, for in Claremont. And Don, my friend from California, Southern California, said uh, uh, this would be a good place to apply to. He thought, he knew a lot of the, about the play. So I did. And that's how I uh, got connected. And when we found out, when we, we knew about it, of course we knew, I knew a Drucker was there. That was the primary attraction. Uh, there was no other knowledge. I'm, a, I'm an East Coast person. So that's how I got in touch with, um, with Drucker and it, almost immediately when we got there and I, I began to qu ask him questions almost every turn. I took his course in 1981, it was a PhD course, and uh, we became friends. It's a long story. I mean, <clears throat> but that's the story as accurately as I can right. remember it. Mm -hmm. I, mean, today, I mean, today we honor you as a 
is the legitimate successor, Peter Trucker, to not well, only advance you. his legacy, but also having contributed in a number of ways to advance his work in a way. And also in the book management, you did not just a revision, an update, but you also brought in your own thinking to systemize. The systems well, thinking. Systems yeah, thinking. Because that's what I, that's my strength. That's what I can do. That's what I can do in a sh sharper way for his material mm -hmm. than he did. Because his system, he was a systems, he was an integrator. But you had to figure it out. You had to figure it out from his work. But it's there. It's all there. And uh, um, it, it, because he starts with the same position that, that he works through for all his life. And, and whether it's in society or in, in, in business, I don't mean he's rigidly consistent with it, but it's there. And so you figure that out. And uh, that's what I'm trying to do. Figure it out. Get it uh, um, down so that I can extend it. Um, in bits and pieces here and there, and uh, but I have no uh, illusions. Uh, he, he was a, a genius, and he was a man of the liberal arts, and he was uh, um, also uh, tough on res tough on results and compassionate, and it's a wonderful blend. You know, tough on performance and results, but uh, very compassionate toward human beings. It's a tough act. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, let me ask a question. That, that captured me, by the way. That you were captured that with tension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, as I said, you kind of devoted your academic life did. to I his did. work, to his oeuvre, to, right. to, to advance it. And my question is, in a way, are you still surprised to discover new things? Or let yes. Me, let me put it also in another way. In the long run, what do you think? Still being surprised, yes. But what are the most enduring ideas which might even hold the test of time in his work yeah, you discovered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we, we were talking earlier about the role of the human being and there's no question that the one thing that's run through all his work was his belief and devotion to the, uh, uh, to the human being, the dignity, the growth, uh, uh, the achievement, uh, and organizations as a, a vehicle for the human uh, human achievement, and and uh, so that goes beyond pure financial outcomes. Okay? There's also the human being to develop, and that is for social benefit. Uh, uh, there's social benefit there. Yeah, social value, as you would say, public value. Public value. Yeah. Say yeah. So uh, that's the key, and so when he. When he was asked in 1981, he, um, he was de delivered a um, calligraphy that was done by Timothy Botts. It was authorized by Bob Buford on the event of his 80th birthday, Peter Drucker's 80th birthday. He was asked um, uh, uh, to sign this calligraphy. And the calligraphy had in it, and, uh, and I have it in my office now, the original and original. There were a thousand or so published that day. That, for that day, to celebrate his birthday. Uh, uh, what is my business? Who is the customer? What does the customer consider value? It's easy to see that who the customer is is inherently human. Right. But what does the customer consider value? That is treacherous. It's human. Mm -hmm. It's not always what manufacturers think often is its utility, but it's utility in a, uh, to, uh, to the human being. And what is the business has to, and has, is also a human question. It has to be answered in terms of, of um, what right do you have to succeed? And that is what, what, what value do you create for, for the customer and identifying the place in the market where, you can, where your strengths match up with um, uh, with either the current uh, needs or wants or projected future needs, unrecognized needs uh, like the iPhone and so on and so forth. And, yeah. So the human being is tied up in all that. And if you, of course, you look at the effect of executive, it's all about, uh, it's heavily about making strengths productive and um, weaknesses uh, irrelevant. Uh, and uh, again, um, developing human strengths and social benefit. 
it's there. You look at the end of it, and he's talking about the broader issues with regard to the human being. Would you agree by saying, often in social science, we argue that theory is also a kind of hidden autobiography, yeah. that very early on experiences in adolescence or early adulthood shape or pave the way of further theory development. Mm -hmm. To my understanding, my question is whether you agree. Yeah, For example, in, the, in, the early, in his early work on Friedrich Stahl, there, the main arguments are already laid out there. Yeah. And the whole work throughout can be also understood right. by having this text R first. Stahl monograph. Fortunately, that was translated into English by Martin Chemers in 2002. It appeared in the uh, Society. Um, Martin was a professor at Claremont McKenna. Yeah, yeah. So I, I have uh, uh, read it. Um, if you read, if you're a student of Drucker, as you are, and I am, if we read Adventures of a Bystander, and, and uh, so many of those articles, you can go back to the, the issues that were raised in that 1932. Right. Uh, or or one, of, one of the three main interests, status and function, uh, continuity and change, uh, legitimate authority. Mm -hmm. You can see those, uh, or making human strengths productive. You can begin to see it in uh, every one of these. So which came first? His understanding of people through his life? Mm -hmm. Or the book? <laughs> that was written in 78. So, I mean, he, as he began to fashion that book, he began to think of people who were interesting. And that, that meant thinking of people who, were refle who reflected his work, right? And then there's an interaction. Yeah. Right, right. So that's what that's that's where I am so far. But you right. know, I, I may find out more later because I find out things all the time. Uh, again. Still surprised. What? You are still surprised to say. Yeah, he, he, his, the depth and breadth of that man is staggering to me. It's absolutely staggering. I mean, all these years that I've been studying, and I, my uh, my whole approach is to take a few things and go deep. So it takes me a long while right. to cover all his stuff. And I'm, I'm still working at it. You mentioned the anthology, A Functioning Society. And finally this summer, I, knew, I, read a, I wrote a foreword for it. Um, uh, but I, this summer, I um, went through it again very carefully and got a lot more out of it. And even though it's an anthology and it's in, in other books that he had written, I have written. Uh, but see what he considered important to include there, right? Right. Yeah. I remember in his own introduction he wrote... Well, that goes back to Stahl. A function, goes back to Stahl. Functioning society, yeah. In his, uh, in his introduction to Functioning society, I remember a sentence by Tucker saying, management was neither my first nor my foremost interest. Right. Could you comment on, yeah, on sure. this one? It goes back to Stahl. <laughs> He's interested in the functioning society. But he begins to understand that, that, uh, that the material world has to be organized, right? And it has to, so as soon as the, you get the emergence of organization, well, they have to be organized, they have to be developed, and they have to produce, uh, um, uh, they have to produce results, right? For the, uh, for the mission uh, or purpose, or the purpose, uh, uh, but also, uh, he, in tasks, responsibilities, and practices, he identifies a productive work and the achieving work, social benefit there, and then s social responsibility. So you have the primary purpose, and then you have leading beyond borders, and then you have the human being in there, right? So, uh, uh, but mission, but the purpose came, comes first to him. Mission, purpose, in his, yeah. And, but uh, that pertained to him, it pertained to the primary uh, eco economic mission. It doesn't mean it's in economic terms, right? right? Yeah, uh, because, because the profit maximization, even if it could be done, is an end, right? It's not, it, it's not, it doesn't order behavior. It doesn't tell you what to do tomorrow. Uh, for him, what you do tomorrow is marketing and innovation. Was, yeah, yeah, entrepreneurship. Yeah. I mean, in the 
21st century, some people say we can't provide too many normative statements in the VUCA world. And on the other hand, of course, Trucker is a man of the 20th century with some recommendations or eternal wisdom for the 21st century. But the way he frames his wisdom, his practical wisdom, even as his advice. As you've said in your article, yeah, it's practical wisdom. practical wisdom. I got in trouble for using that term once, practical wisdom, because somebody attributed it directly to you. And uh, I thought I should give more credit to you on that, and I thought so too afterwards, so I apologize. <laughs> no problem the question. But it's practical the, wisdom, it's the, Aristotle. His, yeah. This Aristotle phonesis, yeah. practical wisdom idea. My question is that in this regard, Peter Trucker is quite normative about effectiveness, what's effective, what's not effective, the task to be done, this kind of thinking. Where does it come from, this strong sense of focusing, putting the individual first, and is it fair to say it's mainly his Christian yeah. belief yeah. system, yeah. or is it one of, the, one of the statements that caused a lot of struggle to understand it, and even disbelief, mm -hmm. was this interview state that he had with Peter Pasha, where he, he called himself a... Uh, a um, a conservative Christian anarchist. Anarchist. Then he explains that conservative is his personal temperament. Right. And I can attest to that. You look at the way he carried out his life, personal in his right. way. The temperament was conservative. Um, Christian, strong interest in the human being and the welfare of the human being as immortal. And that comes from Kierkegaard and other, other places, but strong and, and stall. Strong interest in the human being. And um, anarchists, oh, that really sets people up. Well, there, I believe now that what he was referring to was the limits of government. He was for basically small government, very wary of government, government power. In these regards, he was like uh, Henry Adams and uh, uh, Peter Pasha uh, mentions that. He said, You mean like Henry Adams and uh, the education of Henry Adams and so on? And the, uh, grandchildren of, uh, of a president, our grandchild of our s second president, and son of our uh, uh, fourth or fifth, uh, two Adams we had. And yeah, so uh, when, when you understand it fully, you see that, he, yes, he was, he was ascribing his beliefs as coming from, I mean, he, he, his beliefs were coming from his Christian background. But what he was really doing was making Sec he, was, he was making secular statements mm -hmm. based upon Christian moral values, right? Basically your thesis, right? Right. Yeah. I fully agree that secular statements on the, based on a Christian normative yeah. belief system in a sense. Yeah. Um, I ask myself, in reading your book, Truckers Lost Out of Management, mm -hmm. which really is for the first time a book explicating the intellectual roots, mm -hmm. liberal arts influences right. from his yeah. background. And this is an achievement right. of, of its own. Next to your systemizing yeah. and the management book, it's an achievement of its own right. to show the world this, this kind of right. roots. Yeah. Looking forward, at HHL, we also have emphasized the notion of management as a liberal right. art. If you provide some advice for young students in engaging in this with this book mentioned as a liberal yeah. art, or truckers lost art of management. Why do it? What, why do it? Yeah. Okay, let, let, me, let me ask the question and, and then try to provide an answer. Uh, um, uh, how can a man be one of the leading consultants of the 20th century to global leaders across the world, really, government, uh, Nonprofit and, and uh, business, and yet never have run anything, mm -hmm. never have been an executive. Okay, it, it goes against all the rules. Well, I think the answer at first was in his terrific capacity, mm -hmm. uh, and but his terrific uh, 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 liberal arts background, which included uh, which included uh, the social sciences, the humanities, and also technology. He was the president of the History of Technology Association uh, in the United States for one year, and he had a strong interest in technology because of its effects on work 
and on the human being. Oh, oh, uh, one day I asked him, uh, uh, he asked me, uh, what are you working on? It was at a reception for, for executive students. And we were up against the wall, backed up against the wall, and I said, well, it, uh, uh, right now I'm working on a project on work and human nature. And he said, whoa. Well, I had no idea how central it was to him. But, you know, he, he said that in the reflections of social, social ecology that, uh, that religious ideas um, and work affect so much of what we see in society. Okay? Work and human nature. Right. Yeah. So, in any event, yeah, that's a long answer. Right. You posed a question like this, why should students... Oh, so where do, I'm sorry, so where do assumptions about human nature come from? And there, they're Christian. Right. Yeah, and uh, he says in a number of places. And uh, why should the students... article you quote from uh, Virginia uh, uh, Law Review, uh, or it's also in the Future of Industrial Man. Right. Yeah. The 42 book. Yeah. Which is also one of his, of his most ambitious. I think books so. In it's a general th theory of a functioning society, and then a special theory of the industrial society, right. which then he carried on to the knowledge society. Right. See? and then the, maybe the global digital society. I don't, I don't know where we go from there. But that, we have to think about it if we follow Drucker. Right? Where do we go from there? Digitization is right. in your model, yeah. Right. Maybe one, one, one final question. If you want to make his ideas productive also in our classes and, 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 and teaching, our students are very also very efficient in a sense and they would ask, well, Drucker wrote almost 40 books. Yeah. And if I had a journey, I could only take one, maybe one focusing more on the business world and one more on society. Yeah. What would you yeah. recommend? Yeah, in, to in the business students? world, to me, it would be clear. It would be, uh, well, first of all, there's two short books. Uh, in the business world, it would be clear. It would be the um, effective executive. Uh, even though uh, the tools part is pretty dated, the, the assumptions about the human being that are in there and about the society and about organizations are, are, are you know, very, very relevant. So that's the one I would go to first, uh, and it's um, uh, um, there is value there. <laughs> Obviously, it wouldn't be one of the five great uh, management books of, of the 20th century if, if there were not value. Uh, the, the other book would be The Future of Industrial Man. Uh, because that is, you know, it gives you the social theory, it gives you the, uh, his theory, uh, his uh, general theory of, um, of a functioning society. And then his specific theory of society focused upon, uh, at that time, industrial man. But, but that same model continues to apply. Yeah. Now, I've never studied in depth sociology and so on. And I realize that there's a strong underpinning there in psychology. So, but uh, they seem very right to me uh, as we begin to think about management in business and society and, and for human beings. So we recommend those two books. Yeah, those two right. books. Okay. Yeah. I mean, as I said, it's a great day in our institutional history today to have you here. And, uh, well, it's a great day for me. me. I'm really honored. Thank you and congratulations. Uh, and I thank you. For this honorary doctorate. Well, I thank you.